Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for joining us for this very, um, I mean, I don't know, starting the, out your morning with the boys maybe seems a little off, but <laughs> it wouldn't be the boys if we weren't doing something a little odd. So thank you so much for joining us for this special presentation of Herogasm. And joining me is going to be first, the man that you know as Homelander, Anthony Starr. Next, we have the soup formerly known as Starlight, and who now is known only as Annie January, Aaron Moriarty. <laughs> Next, we have our A-Train, Jesse T. Usher. <laughs> and you know him as Mother's Milk. We have Laz Alonzo. We have Kimiko, we have Karen Fukuhara. And last, but certainly not least, introducing as Soldier Boy, Jensen Ackles. Can I start by saying, wow, you're the most beautiful people I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> What a gorgeous room of voters. <laughs> Seriously. Thank you all for being here. Wow. Really, thank you guys for coming. Beautiful. You should all be in church, but welcome. <laughs> thank you, Ann. I appreciate that. Um. <laughs> I guess this is kind of a church or kind of a cult. I don't know which one it, which one it is. <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> well, I guess that should be where I should start. What would you say is your lasting memory of filming the 70th anniversary and presumably last ever Hero Gasm? Okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna pass this on to my friend here, only because I wasn't really in the, 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 the meat of the episode. <laughs> See what I did? <laughs> Vote Tony. Um, I am gonna hand it over to my friend. I have so many things flashing in front of my eyes right now that I've kind of blanked out since we've shot it. Oh, wow, you're throwing me right in. I'm gonna have to get so graphic. You all just saw it. Um, I mean... Hand sanitizer's good. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, yeah, it, here's the thing. The first day that we arrived on set, there were so many, like, it was like walking, obviously like walking into like an orgy house and our set deck is so good. So every corner was covered with something. And I saw dildos in shapes that I didn't think was were physically possible that could fit into the human body. And I learned a lot, but also I looked at them and I, I learned a lot. I also learned that I'm really prude, but everyone is compared to Herogasm. But I think it was those there were things in shapes that I thought, these would pierce an organ. If like, wouldn't they, like they, I don't think that they would, most people wouldn't survive them, but of course they exist. So I'm just saying any shape you can imagine in any length, it's out there. And I think that would be it. And I still, to this day, I've never looked it up. I don't want to see anything. I don't, I'm too scared to look it up, but I, I, I don't, I don't understand. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I learned, I learned a lot of stuff. Okay, thanks for the panel. <laughs> if you reach under your seats, you'll all find, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but real, no, really, I'm, they're coming back to my, there was one that had like, <laughs> I can't, I'm not gonna describe it. All I'm gonna say is. Don't is, let her fool you folks. She was touching and grabbing everything. Oh yeah, I mean. And shoving it in other people's faces. Mine was one of them. Oh, uh, yeah, it was a really, really good place to um, fuck around with other people and play some practical jokes. But I learned a lot, and I saw a lot of things I can't unsay. And I'll just say that. I don't understand. I don't understand. Well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive down to Jensen here for a moment, because I do want to know what the first thing Eric Kripke said to you about Soldier Boy was. You know, what was... I imagine it wasn't initially this episode, but what was the thing that he told you about this character? This episode, <laughs> I knew this was this was. He had mentioned it, and I, so I knew it was happening in season three. And so, uh, the <laughs> the source material has it going a little differently, significantly, significantly. 
Um, and I didn't know how, you know, verbatim we were going to go, so uh, I was prepared for the worst. Um, luckily, we, <laughs> luckily it, we, we used that as inspiration and went somewhere else, and I think what we ended up with was uh, very, very proud of. Um, but just kind of go back to, to what Aaron was saying, um, I just remember the smell the most. Are we good, um, well, it's just, you know, days of that, and of days that day, because it was uh, three, four days of filming. Four days. Four days. Some of us were there for longer than that. I know. Man. And then when I got there, which was maybe day two, Aaron and Jack were in the green room, and, and you both looked at me, and you're like, you, I mean, you looked like you had just come out of war. Like, it, it was, there was just, there was a different air about both of you. In fact, when I saw our camera operator, he was outside, and he was just staring at the ground. <laughs> and I, I went up, I said, hey, Liam, what's up, man? How's it going up there, you know? And he's like, I've seen some shit, man. <laughs> Traumatized. Uh, and uh, and they, they, they did not prep me uh, uh, well, I mean, Jack was like, I can't wait to see your face when you get up there. And I think it was across the room, both of you, when they said robes off, I was standing next to some background performers, and the robes came off, and I wasn't prepared for what I saw. <laughs> no, no, no. And you have to do the cursory glance of like, Yeah, just you to get it out the way. You gotta, you gotta to. get it out the way early. Just, you gotta, I was like, is, 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 is he wearing anything? No. And he wasn't. And oh my God. Uh, and then across the set, I just see, I see Jack and Aaron going like, ha, ha. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that, that was, a, that was a, a few days of, I mean, it just smelled like old sex after a while. It really, it really did. Uh, and there was nothing that Kripke could have said to me to prepare me for that day. Um, but in, in an overall, kind of going back to your question, um, he, he basically just did that Kripke laugh. You've got, you do a good, ah! yeah, 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 that one. Um, uh, and and, and I, I knew things were going to get dicey uh, very quickly, and they did. He, he uh, there's some shit that I shot that didn't even make the final cut that I'm like, really? You made me do that? <laughs> you knew you weren't going to use it, but you made me do that anyway? I see what, how this relationship is. What could is, that be? Oh, no, that's oh, true. God, that is you true. Have, you, can't, you can't even imagine. I'll tweet it after. <laughs> Well, what's kind of amazing about an episode like Herogasm and, and the idea that, you know, you know, as a fan, you kind of walk into this being like, this is going to be this crazy superhero moment. And it really is an episode that has so many other layers to it. It's, an, it's kind of what you guys do so well with this show. It has moments of people, you know, everybody has to face something. Yeah, and, and, and <laughs> serious conversation now, because we're competing with Lord of the Rings. So... <laughs> And they're all fucking, you know, they're very serious. So, uh, yeah, no. That's one of the things, that is one of the things about the show is like, it is, um, we, can, we can hold these crazy episodes and crazy big, I mean, we, you know, we had a, a guy jumping in the eye of a, a dick and it's like, that sounds crazy, but it's also, Maybe not with that example, but you, but there's a lot of story going on. It's, it's all driven by character. The needs of the character drives the narrative, and um, that is something that it, it, that the show. I, I do believe the show walks that kind of knife edge. You know, no, there's no such thing as a <laughs> perfect tightrope walk, but it does straddle those worlds pretty well. And, and you know, throughout this episode, even though there's a lot of distracting uh, things going on. You know, there's a lot of heavy, very intense story going on for me and El Padre over there, and, and you guys have got a big thing going on. Everyone's got a lot going on. Well, let's talk about some of those things that were going on in this episode. Aaron, I'm going to start with you, because we just saw the official hanging up of the cape, that Starlight is no more. It's only Annie January from here on out. As you were kind of filming this episode and, and the various things that Annie goes through from, you know, finally from facing off with Newman and being like, you know what, I'm done. I'm done with everyone telling me how to live my life. And then, of course, her, her laying it bare, if you will, with Huey. They really have to go there with what's going on in their relationship. What stood out to you about this moment of transformation for her? Yeah, I mean, I feel like the whole show up until now has been building up until this moment. And I think... 
you know, it's one of those situations where external to the situation, as an audience member, you watch it and you're waiting for it to happen. Um, and I just think that, you know, there is this, there's a very real internal battle she's going through that I think a lot of people are going through. I think a lot of women are going through right now um, that work in corporations that they feel maybe still have, maybe not overt, but... Um, um, underlying misogynistic systemic issues. She she is trying to figure out whether she's going to change things internally or externally. And I think when she is, you know, tapped as co-captain, the question is, maybe in this position of power, I can change some change some things. And I think. A, she doesn't want to be dictated by this corporation or these, in her eyes and in everyone's eyes, horrible people anymore. But also, it begs the question that I think is very relevant now, which is misogyny is a word that's used often and it's no longer taboo and now we are sort of... Uh, the it, it woke culture, everyone is a proponent of feminism. The question is really, what's the motive? Is it genuinely to put a woman in a position of power or is it to feed consumerism and is it just exhibitionist feminism? And I think that what she realizes is everything that she's involved in, no matter what position she's in, even if it's co-captain, it's all exhibitionist, it's all bullshit, and the only change she's going to be able to enact is outside of the seven um, but it was interesting to play such a such an a p significant moment for Annie with all of these circumstances <laughs> going on in the background because there's so many moments with Huey where I have to be really distraught and like Soldier Boy is about to come in and fucking like just uh, obliterate everyone but then I'm looking around and I'm seeing the circumstances I'm in and that I th feel like was the most challenging <laughs> thing to do is transcend the the absurd circumstances around me but I think that that whole concept of exhibition, exhibitionist feminism versus genuine feminism, or whatever word you want to use, um, comes into play, and she combusts, but in a way that's really good. So it was really satisfying to play. Every man up here just went, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have to. No emotion. As Don't give a fucking indication <laughs> of what you're thinking. <laughs> just nod. Don't smile, don't, smile, don't do frown, not. completely neutral. <laughs> totally. I literally looked across and every guy here was like, <laughs> slightly terrified to move. You should be terrified. <laughs> we are. Well, Jesse, I'm gonna I'm, if, if you're if you're prepared, I'm gonna I'm gonna come to you next because A Train similarly is is. He goes through a journey in this hour from A-Train to Africa. Uh, <laughs> all the way to finally apologizing to Huey for real. Um, you know, he first his face, of course, with Ashley telling him how it really is, how it doesn't, it has never mattered to him until it affects him. What was it, as you kind of charted this, this quick kind of turn for him that I guess this, this season has been building up to as well, what was it that really stood out to you? Oh man, probably Jack Quaid in that pink robe was probably the <laughs> highlight. No, to be honest with you, it, it was a long time coming and it was something that I feel like A-Train had been battling with from the very start of this series and it's caused a lot of turmoil inside of him that he just hasn't had an outlet to let out. And um, I think he's just been looking for other ways to sort of navigate through that and it's been very you know, misguided and it corrupt and just all the things that he sort of just backed himself into um, up until this point. So when he's met, you know, in this house, in this room across from, from uh, Huey and he has an opportunity to finally say something genuine, I just think all of the things that have been ringing in his head for the last, you know, big, big chunk of time has, has just come out in an apology. And I think he actually meant it because of just how he felt about himself finally. Uh, you know, I've been waiting for, I think we all, have, you know, everyone has who's been watching the show, they've been waiting for him to feel something um, genuine inside of himself that, that can be expressed uh, in, a, in a safe place, I and mean, probably the most unsafe so place. Safe. <laughs> but, but, like, for him, you know, he just felt 
torn down. You know, he's, he's ripped to shreds, and he just felt like apologizing was the thing to do. And I, I think at that point, it just sort of opened up the door for him a little bit to then start to consider making a change. Um, but it, it just the weight of the situation, it's just the circumstances that he's in. You know, it's just not a lot that he can do besides just say I'm sorry and uh, and to mean it. And it was it was a very um, it was a very uh, eye-opening moment for me playing A Train because I hadn't had an opportunity to actually uh, tap into that. Not yet. It's always been like this surface level apology. It's always been this cold, uh, you know, asshole guy who's just is very easy to kind of just like brush something off of his shoulder. And it, it was difficult to stand across from Jack in a pink robe and in a room full of sex and and <laughs> say, you know, sorry. So uh, that that was fun to that was that was actually a really really fun experience to sort of play off of Jack because he's he's so good at like locking in in the moment and you know you can just tell that that um, that he feels something too so yeah it was it was a really good really good day for us and then of course it quickly pivots because this this isn't the end of A Train's day not at all <laughs> so when we we see him essentially lose it with Blue Hawk you know he didn't come there necessarily to get that type of justice, but that's a Absolutely. justice he decides to enact. Um, we see the way, for those of y'all who have seen, who, how many people have seen the entire season? Okay, perfect. All right. All right. Yeah. We don't All have the to worry best about looking spoilers. <laughs> All the best looking voters. <laughs> Classic. You guys are good what looking, are you're well prepared. <laughs> So through the, <laughs> we see... Oh, come on, come on. This is an exchange. Come on. <laughs> We're parading around looking for votes. <laughs> that is literally why we've been wheeled out. The fucking meat puppets are here to go, ah, oh, vote, vote. Let's not be shy about it. See if Daisy Jones and the Six come up and say that. <laughs> I bet they fucking won't. <laughs> okay, see ya. Anthony Starr. <laughs> Anthony Starr, everybody. Uh, that's um, my career. The <laughs> Jesse, the flip side of that coin is what then A Train does to Blue Hawk, dragging him to death, mm -hmm. quite literally. Um, what, <laughs> how does he, or how can he come back for this? What, what was going through your mind as he makes this kind of split second decision that this is what's gonna happen? I don't think it was split second at all. I think it was premeditated. I think he, had decided what was going to happen before he even showed up. You know, this is the reason why he walked into Herogasm with, with the intention that he had. You know, he was looking right past all the, non, all the bullshit, going straight for Blue Hawk. He didn't care what he was doing at the time. He knew he was, was going to drag him. And uh, he knew what that meant for him. Um, you know, he doesn't have a heart that can, that can withstand a stunt like this. So uh, I think all of that had been considered before he even gets into the moment. And regardless of what was what the outcome was going to be he knew what he was he knew what he was going to do and i just think that having that moment with jack or with huey uh beforehand was the only unexpected turn that took place you know and then almost immediately after he still just goes back to his mission which is to find blue hawk and to um invoke justice at any and all costs so yeah Listen, got a little absolution before his potential suicide mission. That that's not a right. bad way. Yeah, you know, he, he gave a little salute before he before he checked out. You're not really a bad guy, is what he was saying. And yeah, I like that. Uh, I mean, like, somewhere in the middle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm, you've done a lot of shit. Somewhere in the middle. <laughs> well, Laz, we know how this episode, or, well, how parts of this episode started for Mother's Milk. He is confronted um, with love sausage again. <laughs> <laughs> Go but ahead. There, but there's, Story of my life. <laughs> but there's... <laughs> you know, it's a running theme. I'll let you continue. <laughs> but there's so much more to it than happens in the very sticky episode that he goes through. He has to, He really finally divulges a lot of the reason behind, you know, what we've kind of been waiting to find out, how he ended up with this OCD, what, what the thing has been that's been driving him this whole time. Turns out to be Soldier Boy here. You know, the kind of the conversations that you and Aaron as Annie had in this episode, how did you, what did it, how did you feel about getting to kind of dive into 
the precise reasons why Mother's Milk is the way he is, what he's fighting for, why he's willing to do this when his, his daughter Janine is at home. So for, <clears throat> for me, uh, portraying this character, which I have become a fan of in the last four seasons, uh, having the opportunity to portray him, it felt so incredibly satisfying to finally share with the world the backstory that Kripke and I had developed in private, but had just never made it on camera. So for you know seasons one and two, where we're kind of establishing who he is, not just as a person, but within the group, um, there was always, you know, who is Mother's Milk? Why is he called Mother's Milk? You know, where does he come from? Like, why is he that way? And to finally have the opportunity to explain, you know, the origin story of this man's trauma um, was, was something that, that was tremendously satisfying. And it was also creatively satisfying for me. Um, Kripke and I actually were talking about his backstory during the George Floyd protests. That's when his backstory, our version of his backstory, really came to life. And I asked Kripke to use MM to lean into this. You know, like systemic racism is something that is so traumatic and pervasive in the African-American community that it is it is something that is almost <clears throat> encoded in DNA when it comes to, uh, you know, we always talk about generational wealth. Well, there's also something like called generational trauma that's passed on, fears. You know, conversations that parents have to have with their kids and teenage sons, and if they run into a cop, you know, put your hands on a steering wheel, face them up, don't do any sudden movements, conversations that Fortunately, everyone doesn't have to have those conversations. And I asked Kripke, let's lean into it. You know, let's, let's, let's have this conversation and find a way to, to take what's happening, you know, as we, as we have with all the other stories in society right now and infuse it into the show. And he was, he was down with it. You know, and so over the, 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 the months leading up to us getting on set, um, it was a, a very fruitful, you know, by no means am I a writer, <laughs> but it, it was great to be able to, to have that dialogue and that back and forth um, to help create what would be Mother's Milk's um, arc in season three. So it was something that, that we, we were able to collaborate with together with the purpose of um, showing that, you know, some of these mental health issues that Mother's Milk deals with, primarily OCD, you know, it, just didn't, it just didn't happen on its own. It was anchored in trauma. And connecting it to, you know, to Soldier Boy and this, this character that to the world was this upstanding, morally upright symbol of American exceptionalism. And to be able to, to weigh that exceptionalism that it may not apply to everyone equally was something that for me as an artist, I felt it was my duty to tell that story as honestly as possible while I'm getting slapped over the head with 12 foot penises <laughs> and dumped with gallons and gallons of gooky stuff. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it's the kind of stuff that is what I, what I love about what I do. You know, is the ability to be able to entertain, but at the same time, leave you with some real shit. And hopefully, you guys felt it. That, that's, all, that's all we wanted, was for you guys to feel it and understand it. And, and it's powerful, too, the way that it kind of is uh, the kind of dichotomy between Mother Milk's, Mother's Milk's story and A-Train's, the kind of performative activism that we see from him this season, the, the turbo uh, commercial, things like that. You know, well, you know, we talked about that too because uh, A-Train and Mother's Milk are dealing with very similar things from two totally different places. You know, him being the, the corporate, you know, 
having endorsements and having to code switch and be one face in private and one face in public. And, you know, we've seen that recently with, you know, some NBA players who tend to make mistakes over and over again. <laughs> you know, and then you have... You Gee, know, what do you mean? <laughs> no names called. But then you got Mother's Milk, who's on the opposite side of that, you know, who, who's the freedom fighter, who's out... Uh, on the streets, and, and he has a little bit more uh, of a ability to express himself without having, you know, the the risk that a, a Train's character would of loot of loss, mm -hmm. you know. But at the same time, you know, they're both still haunted by the same threat, mm -hmm. and they both have to deal with the same thing. Karen, I'm, I'm gonna turn Hi. to you next because at the end of this episode, um, Kimiko and Frenchie have, I just feel like one of the most profound moments where she's kind of distraught at the idea that with, with or without her powers, she's a monster. And he reassures her and, and says the idea that, you know, one, she's not, but also this idea that no matter how much they try to run, you cannot run your past. And it feels like everybody goes through a little bit of that in this episode. What did you kind of make of the arc that she goes on in these episodes, including, of course, that amazing, you guys didn't get to see it in this episode, but that amazing musical number that we're just coming off of when we get to Herogasm? Yeah, um, I think Kimiko's arc for season three is about rebirth and really coming to terms with um, her past. And so... Unlike everyone else, uh, getting her powers, or I guess kind of like Starlight, but um, it wasn't up to her, right? It, it, it was injected into her. She didn't want the powers. She's never wanted them. It's kind of made her into this monster uh, that she never wanted to be. She just wants to be a normal girl that is enjoying life, isn't so violent. Um, and even in, you know, earlier in the season during the dildo fight, she, she is doing that as an act of like heroism. Um, and yes, she, she murders uh, the oligarch with a dildo, but um, it, she, she doesn't realize until the end of the fight that uh, the girls are deathly afraid of her and they see her as this monster. And so uh, this whole season is about her coming to terms with her powers. And, you know, our, our show is about what someone does with their power, whether it's political power or a superpower um, or the effect that someone can have on another human being. Um, and by the end of the season, she, uh, she reclaims it. And um, thank God she got her powers back, right? <laughs> I was scared for a second. <laughs> Yes, we get that second technically musical number with Maniac at the very end. Yes, yes. But can we talk about your superpower, though, for a second? Because you're also singing, right, in, in, that, in that episode? I did a lot of rehearsing for that. But yes, uh, lots of dance rehearsal and, um, and, and singing rehearsals for that. Um, yeah. Oh, was that you? It was, yeah. I, I recorded I didn't it. Know that. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Dude, yeah. I'm always impressed. Like, well, that, that's good that you didn't realize. No, it's, it's amazing. Then it was okay. If I yeah. was singing in a number, fucking strangled cat, like awful. <laughs> I'm always impressed by that. Isn't that impressive? Vote for her. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna let go of that. <laughs> It is why we're here. He's not wrong. Um, Jensen, for you, um, in, this, in this episode, we do finally get that opportunity for Homelander and for Soldier Boy to come face to face. It is just as explosive as I think any of our, uh, any of our, uh, you know, the fans would have wanted to see. What, honestly, how long did filming that particular face-off scene between all of you guys take? It was a two-day, two-day yeah, thing. Yeah, give or take. Um, you know, it was uh, <clears throat> it was interesting because in that same set, that same hallway, uh, it's it's when MM and Soldier Boy meet as well, and it's such it's such a unique, uh, um, you know, there, there there was such a unique dynamic between that situation, and then moments later, you have the Soldier Boy Homelander uh, meet, and it's. That hallway was, we, we got some money out of that hallway. <laughs> that's, that set uh, 
that set was really, really used and, and abused. Um, cause then ultimately we didn't have that, uh, that massive fight scene. Um, but it was, uh, it was, it was really cool. That was my first scene, I think with, with you, uh, with you and Carl, uh, kind of all in the same, the same group. Now we had been, we had been rehearsing and, and, uh, doing stunt training for that fight scene for weeks. Yeah. Weeks. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, that guy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know quite. It did. It took weeks. And, and, oh, yeah. And God bless our, our stunt crew and, and, and Coy and, and his whole team uh, because they, they really are unbelievably talented professionals in what they do. And we got to come in and on our off days and, and train and fight. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's learning a dance. It's so heavily choreographed. And I, I got to say, like, I was just so, uh, um, so pleased and proud of the work that Ant and Carl put into it. And I just remember going like, there's very, I, I, don't, I think there's very few people in, in, that I've worked with anyway and that I've seen that have the athletic capability that, that Ant and, and had in that, you know, in being able to do this, but then also juxtapose that with the amount of, of emotion that gets put into those little moments. Um, you know, you get that a lot with this one next to me too. Uh, but the uh, the athleticism mixed with that kind of emotion and telling the story through the little moments of, of him, you know, slamming Soldier Boy up against uh, the wall and choking him. And there's just those, and we, get, we did that so, so many times and we were beat up. We were truly beat up. I, I think our stunt doubles only got to do one or two gags. We did everything else. Yeah, no, we did everything. And in and, um, and that moment... And, and that, those moments, that I think that's just really, um, we, we get to really hang our hat on those uh, at the end of the day and be like, we did something special today. Um, it may not have been an emotional scene, but it, was, it, was, it took its toll for sure. And, and that was, you know, it was right in the wake of, of us meeting. And I just remember looking down the hallway and seeing him and knowing what was about to be, what was yeah. coming. And I just was like, fucking here we go. <laughs> And I, I remember looking on. down. I remember looking down the hallway, going, "What the fuck is down there?" Because I couldn't wear my glasses. <laughs> right, right. He was like, "And all I get, can all I get, I get my hair glasses?" Is and go, like, "Buddy, you think you look tough in a cape?" And I was like, "Who fucking said that? <laughs> Who's talking?" And they point me the right way. Oh yeah, you fly that way. I uh, guess it makes the dig hurt a little less when you don't see where it came from. <laughs> yeah, I was like, "Put it sticks and stands, bitch." <laughs> but uh, but I can't see you. So, well, and you then know. the and then the cape pull in the fight. That yeah, was... we, they were, so, so fun fact, they actually, because we have a very tight schedule, so we, we put a lot of work in, like weeks and weeks and weeks, like, like we said, uh, amen. And, uh, and then when we get there uh, on the day, you know, nothing, you know, what was Mike Tyson's thing? Uh, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah, that's any film set, right? So we get there and everything gets collapsed. They wanted to cut that out. And they want, there's all these chunks they wanted to take out. And even in the build-up, they wanted to take out the flag, the, the cape, cape pull-down. Yeah. Pull and they wanted to take out the angled laser moment with me and Carl. And Carl and I came back, pushed back and said, look, that is, that's the show. It's a meaningful that moment. Is, that is the show in an image. And that's just funny, having the American, that, that's just a great moment. Uh, and they put it back in, and I think it, it really is. Because that, I mean, ultimately, sh the show is about the little man taking down the big man, right? Mm. The big corporations and that. And that, in one frame, in one moment, is, you know, it's a metaphor for the show. And, and you know, it's interesting what you said before. Sorry to just zip back to something else. The, the hallway moment with you two mixed with... Uh, yeah, sorry, not you, Jesse. Like, I wasn't in the hallway. <laughs> Different hallway. So, but that, the whole, the mother's milk and Annie moment in the hallway, it's interesting because like you see a lot of action shows or a lot of superhero shows and if there's a fight between us, you know, Padre and Nino, um, you'd stick on that. You want to see all the violence and all that and we just start it and then there's a very deliberate choice to cut away to this, to, to these guys having this very serious dilemma. Uh, which I think is a really interesting take, and I think it's one of the things that this show does really well. Is it, it 
it's again straddling lines. It's that it's that line between the the intense physical craziness and the, the, the wacky stunts and all that, but it's all anchored in drama. And uh, yeah, if I if I could jump in is you know to piggyback on Ant's point, piggyback, um, do a little piggyback. Uh, you know, I think that's what has made this show, at least in my experience working in this business for twenty years, unique, and that's that we have that opportunity to pitch and to push back and to call Kripke, who's three hours earlier here on set at six in the morning in, in Toronto, and it's three in the morning here. It's like, get Kripke on the phone because, you know, this doesn't make sense and we really, really need this. And, and to be able to have that collaborative thing, that culture of collaboration that Kripke has created on this set, it really, in my opinion, and I, and I find it hard for anybody to disagree, I, I think that's what's elevated our show because he has not closed the door on us and said, this is what you're doing, go repeat these lines. And that, no, he actually has a, a very, you know, you can't do it at the last minute. <laughs> you know, give him a few days, don't wait till we're on set, you know. But he's created a culture of collaboration that we all have the opportunity to, to pitch our ideas and, you know, I don't, I don't know if this works. And, mm -hmm. and, it, and it really does help the show. That's all, that's all really I can say. We're the only Amazon show to do that. <laughs> so vote for us. <laughs> true fact. The other, the other shows might not tell you. No, 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 that, that's true. <laughs> Write that down. Although I do, I do wish that I hadn't have inhaled all that halothane in that scene between you and I. That was, that, uh, that was not scripted. And as I was just like, hey, is this stuff? It's not toxic, right? They were like, sure. They're like, oh, you're good. No, it's fine. It's totally fine. I was like, all right, cool. Watch this. <laughs> After about the eighth take, I was like, this was a bad idea. I shouldn't have done this. You were the color of your suit. I, yeah, that's take. right. Yeah. Did you get a water? But it looked so cool. It did look cool. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you have to do the things that, that you know, you got to do them anyway. I want to kind of close this out, um, yes, by talking a little bit about the, the, the face-off here between Homelander and Soldier Boy. You know, we see as the season goes on, there are more things that we learn about these two. But it, 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 it kind of takes the mirror moment, Ant Antony, that you have... Um, in this episode even further because it presents a different type of mirror mm -hmm. between these two. And I just wanted to quickly kind of get both of your takes about the idea that these two characters share a significant amount um, of characterization. I guess I'll say that for the three people who don't know how this ends. <laughs> Chip off the old block. <laughs> so, yeah, the mirror scene was really interesting because, uh, I mean, I've always looked at my guy as... Um, the weakest character on the show, despite being the strongest, right? Because he's emotionally buckled and, um, you know, he's in emotional suspended animation at 14 or something. So, so he craves connection, has always wanted that. The mirror scene came up because uh, it was very different, actually, when, when it started. We, and then I pitched something to Eric and he went, yeah, great. And so we created this, this, this uh, imaginary friend character that, Little Homelander would have created that has kept that he's kept with him through his life. That's gotten warp, more warped as Homelander's psyche got more, more warped. Um, but at the base of it all is just this is going to sound a little corny. Bear with me, but it's just a little boy that wants love, and and that's the Achilles heel. Hey, I I, I, I disclaimed I that, that was going to uh, that internal. was audible. I, I thought that was interesting. Anyway. Little eye roll moment. <laughs> no, I could hear your judgment. <laughs> I, I did say it was going to be corny, but it is. It's just a little kid wanting love, and that's the Achilles heel that um, Jensen's character is. And we were so lucky to get him, first of all. Um, yeah, right? Thank you, Jensen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. He flew yeah, no, in for we're this. We're so lucky, brother. <laughs> well, no, but I, I'm the lucky one, guys. I'm the lucky one. <laughs> To be a yeah, part of the cast all that deserves here. all the awards. <laughs> I mean, they were already Emmy nominated before, so now plus Jensen, what does that mean? <laughs> That's just 
the sky's the limit. <laughs> but no, because it, it, was, it was great because Eric cast, they've worked together for a long time on Supernatural and, you know, um, and then J Jensen turned up and, and you know, it's, there was a lot of curiosity. I know I'm only going to speak for myself. I was like, who's this guy? But no, uh, actually, I, he told me about the casting process and putting tapes down and all that. He fucking earned this, this part. And then, and it's funny because we do set things in isolation in the show, except we come together at the, at the end for the, especially the, I love doing the scene in the end, in the last episode with you. But once I saw what he's been doing, separate to what I was doing and what a lot of people were doing, uh, he really took that character and ran with it. And it could have been all sorts of messy cliches, and it wasn't. It was great. It was, so, it was funny. Somehow toxic masculinity became amusing. <laughs> Go figure, charm boy. Um, but it was, it, you did an amazing job with it. And it was really, um, it was a treat doing all the scenes that we did together. And oh, I just like him. <laughs> I sort of, I've wound myself to just, just say you like, I just like him. It is, it's such a multi-tonal show that, and that's to come on and, and to just get to, to work with these incredibly talented people and see the, I was a fan of the show uh, before I even had a conversation about coming on. And so um, I was, uh, I, I was nervous as, as hell walking onto that set because in my opinion, I was just like, don't. Don't be the weakest link. Don't mess up. Just, he, he, Kripke's giving you the ball to run with it. Don't drop it. And, um, and the greatest thing was is none of them would have let me. And I think that that speaks volumes not only to, uh, to the show and the way that it gets presented in such an, an excellent way and such a, uh, an elevated way, but it also speaks volumes to these people who make it uh, and make it that way. And I, I, it's, it's something I'm just really, really proud of. Uh, one of the most proud of, proudest kind of experiences I've had in this career in my, in my, my time as an actor. Well, we hope that this was a sufficient appetizer for you all. Thank you guys so much for joining us on this lovely Sunday. And consider Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks for coming out, guys.